Welcome again to this uh, uh, presentation of model two now, uh, the first lesson of model two. Uh, this is of course the Young Economist Network of ECA EDEP, uh, where the focus is on macroeconomic modeling for sustainable development. My name is Professor Sylvain Boko, and today in module two, lesson one, I would like to uh, review with you how to go about using regression analysis for economic policy modeling. So what we want to do is essentially being able to, for those of you who have seen it before, and also if you have not seen it, to understand the importance of uh, uh, using regression analysis to be able to, un to establish uh, relationships between different policy variables and the impact that it could, they could have on uh, other uh, exogenous uh, variables that we will be uh, we will be looking at. So you are going to hear things uh, today in terms of uh, what is a regression model, in terms of what is uh, an endogenous variable and what is an exogenous variable. How do you go about estimating a regression model and how do you go about understanding whether it is a good or bad model in terms of uh, the various, uh, the various uh, means of gauging of uh, evaluating uh, a, a model in regression analysis. So let's get to it. Uh, we will start with a simple uh, regression, uh, linear regression model. Uh, this is very simple. It is essentially um, our way of drawing, of modeling a relationship between uh, a given endogenous variable, uh, also known as dependent variable, and, uh, and one, one uh, uh, exogenous variable, also known as independent variable, okay? Um, and so when a regression model involves such one dependent variable and one exogenous variable, it is known as univariate regression analysis. Sometimes it's useful just to quickly establish whether there is a significant relationship between uh, you know, a, an independent variable and a dependent variable. Uh, and we will go over the examples uh, very soon. When you have uh, a model uh, which involves one dependent variable and multiple exogenous variables uh, on the right hand side, it is known as a multiple regression analysis. Okay. And so, what we want to do is uh, go through first uh, a univariate, an example of a univariate uh, regression model, and then uh, and then after that, we will then uh, move uh, to uh, looking at a multiple, an example of a multiple regression uh, analysis. So let, let's begin with uh, the following notation. So we will use Y. Uh, this is typical notation, by the way. So typically in a regression analysis, Y uh, would be used to denote the endogenous variable or the dependent variable, okay? Um, and and uh, X, in this case, we only have one exogenous variable in the first example. So my X is going to be denoting the independent uh, variable. And so the terms here is also something you need to get used to. So uh, in regression analysis, when I say dependent or endogenous variable, those two are the same. 
And usually that's the left hand side. That's my Y. Okay, that's my dependent or endogenous variable. When I use the term independent or exogenous or explanatory variable, all three of those terms are indicating the same thing. Okay, and those would be the right hand side variables. Okay, so in this particular example, uh, it is my variable x1. Okay, um, uh, so you have uh, 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 you have uh, now as we put together the the model. Okay, uh, we will first think about what would happen to y if there was no x, no uh, if there was no explanatory variable, if x one was equal to zero. Okay. Uh, so if if that's the case, then y would be equal to b, uh, some 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 number, okay? Uh, y would be equal to some number, which we will call the constant or the intercept, okay? Uh, and so that would be we will call that number uh, b naught, a beta naught, okay? So uh, my notation here is in beta, okay? Uh, like the alphabet, alpha, beta, et cetera. So beta not, right? And so uh, that would be if uh, my exogenous variable was equal to zero, right? So if, if my uh, uh, x1 is equal to zero, then of course, y would be equal to something. Um, and then we will have to find from the, uh, from the estimation what is uh, better not, whether it is zero, whether it is one or, or positive or negative, uh, that would be something that would come out of the estimation. Now, um, the relationship between the two variables will usually be measured uh, in terms of a slope. Because this is a linear relationship. So we assume that, uh, you know, the whatever, line would represent graphically would represent the relationship would be a straight line okay uh, in in our simple example here and so the slope of that line would be measured by beta one uh, so and uh, in economics what that means is essentially uh, the response in y uh, as you change uh, x1 by uh, a unit Right? What is the response uh, in Y? And so that again, uh, beta one, uh, you know, would have to be uh, measured from the estimation. Is it zero? Is it negative? Is it positive? Uh, how significant is it uh, in terms of the, uh, the relationship? Because really what you're saying is that beta one measures that relationship. If I change uh, x1 by a certain percentage, how does y respond? And that response uh, is measured by beta 1. Now, because you can't capture every little thing that happens in the world in one model, we allow for what's known as residuals, right, in a, in a model. So there will have to be some uh, uh, proportion of the dependent variable that can't be captured, that will not be captured in this model by uh, the explanatory variable. So that's the residual, or again, in, in, in other, uh, another way of saying is the, the error term. Okay, so if, what is the proportion of the dependent variable not being explained by, uh, by the exogenous variable? Okay, that's what we are measuring uh, by, uh, by the residual. So here the residual is, uh, is being represented by epsilon. Okay, so the whole model uh, in a simple linear regression uh, is represented by y, equal to beta naught, okay, my, my intercept or constant, 
uh, plus uh, beta one times X one uh, plus epsilon, okay? Now, um, what, are we, what does this model mean? Okay, what does this model mean? This relationship. Okay, that's what we are going to try to explain. So uh, what it means essentially as an analyst is that you are positing, you are hypothesizing, you are assuming that there is a relationship between uh, the dependent variable Y and the exogenous variable X1, okay? Uh, now, so that's your, uh, your hypothesis. The direction and strength of that relationship is measured by the coefficient beta one. So beta one could be uh, zero, it could be uh, positive, it could be negative, uh, but in any case, for us to say that there is any type of uh, relationship, we also need to measure the significance of that relationship. So we will see that, okay? Uh, so what we want to do uh, now is to give an example, okay? Uh, so let's say there is uh, a government program that is, the government wants to reach a certain objective, let's say. Remember, this is, uh, we are gearing this towards policy, right? So, uh, so let, let us assume that there is a government program uh, to train youth, okay? And we want to know whether government expenditures uh, would have a particular impact, uh, what type of impact on youth employment, okay? Uh, so that is, you have on the right-hand side uh, uh, data on both uh, youth employment and government expenditure, okay? And suppose that it is a, a, a program that government is putting out in order to help. Right. So what we want to know is whether these government expenditures, and this will be monthly, would have a significant impact on youth employment. So our dependent variable, so this is the variable that we want to explain. Okay, and that we, we are trying to uh, see the impact of policy on that variable. So that is going to be, we will call it jobs, subscript Y, right? So jobs, youth jobs. So, that, so I'm, we're just calling it jobs Y. Now, our explanatory variable or independent variable would be called GX. In other words, that's going to be our, uh, the government expenditure. Now, we collected, the, the data is presented here in terms of monthly data. Okay, so uh, 2021 would be uh, January, 2022, February, etc. So this, is, this uh, is not real data, of course, we are just, giving an example here for illustration purposes. But you can see uh, the numbers in terms of what uh, we think uh, when government spent, for example, 8,350, whatever units, uh, millions, billions, whatever, uh, in the first month of 2020, what is the impact on uh, jobs, youth jobs, 21. Um, you have uh, uh, in, in the second month of 2020, uh, 23,000 have a huge increase in government expenditure, went up to 23,755. Uh, Again, whatever unit and whatever currency, doesn't matter. Uh, but we see in our example here that jobs went up 
by uh, a lot, went to 180. Uh, in the third month, government expenditure went down a bit to 13, 455. Jobs went down to uh, 50, et cetera. So you have uh, the, all the, the data uh, on, on uh, government expenditure and data on uh, jobs, youth jobs. This also tells you something. You cannot do regression analysis without data, right? So, um, and the, the quality of your data determines the quality of your results. Uh, so, uh, so if you can have the theoretical, the best theoretical models, but as, uh, as long as you don't have the data to actually estimate those models, uh, it is difficult to see, to know uh, the, whether your model is actually useful or not, right? So data, data, data. Data is the, the blood, right, of uh, regression analysis. So some of the questions that we will uh, ask. So this is, that's the example uh, is, of, you have the data, okay? And so let's say we use, uh, a methodology called the ordinary least square. That's the, the most common methodology used. Uh, there are many other uh, methods. Uh, for example, we are going to see uh, in the next lesson, we are going to talk about time series uh, analysis. We are going to talk about uh, PERs and, and so on, um, error correction methods and so on. And so, there are many methods that can be used for regression analysis. The, the, the most common uh, you know, is uh, the ordinary least square method, particularly for linear relationships like this. Uh, so this estimates the, uh, the relationship between the youth uh, jobs and expenditure by the government, right? So this is, uh, so what we will, you will see both in this example and the multiple regression example is that we will use uh, a method called OLS to estimate uh, that relationship. Secondly, uh, we will uh, provide a graphical representation uh, of, the, of the data and the, the estimated model. Okay, this is always good to see graphically. In fact, usually what you do first when you have a data, a set of data like this, is to uh, is to put it in terms of graphical representation to see uh, to just visualize to visualize right the relationship. The relationship may not be linear. It might be cubic. It might be in any way. It might be nonlinear relationship. Uh, and so you need to be able to, you know, it might be a square. So you need to be able to see graphically, uh, you know, what is, what the relationship looks like. Uh, and then that would also inform the type of uh, uh, modeling approach that you would use. And so, and then when, once you get your estimated uh, uh, results, you also want to see whether your estimation is a good fit, you know, why and why not, if, if that's not the case. So we will also see uh, the, what are the indicators of goodness of fit uh, uh, in terms of the results of your model estimation. Once you have convinced yourself that you have used the, uh, the right methodology, uh, and that you are in fact capturing adequately the, uh, the types of relationship existing between your variables. Uh, and you have convinced yourself that in fact, your uh, estimation results are a are, are good fit. In other words, that they, uh, they follow uh, the usual uh, indicators of goodness of fit, okay? 
then it's only then that you are ready to answer the questions, okay? That would be posed to you. Uh, and such a question might be, um, you know, has government expenditure, has it had a positive or negative impact on youth job creation, right? So you have these youth job programs uh, that government is implementing throughout the economy. And then, so the question is, has the impact be positive or negative on, on creating jobs for the youth, right? So this is a legitimate current, uh, always present question for particularly for African government, right? Youth jobs. And so, and then the next question you would have to, to answer is, okay, so you have your estimation uh, and you have, you think that is, you know, it's a good estimation in terms of the indicators of goodness of fit. Then the question is how strong, how significant is the impact, right, of government expenditure on youth jobs creation? Okay, so this, this approach of regression analysis uh, can help us answer those questions. And what we will see is that once we understand the basics of regression analysis, then we can, uh, we can now use uh, that approach uh, in what's known as uh, macroeconometric modeling, right? Such as uh, time series, for example, or uh, vector autoregression analysis, et cetera. So, so what we are, we are actually doing here is we moved from less uh, module one, where we were sort of uh, going over general uh, look at, uh, you know, the oh, sort of macro theoretical structural macroeconomic models. And, and now we are moving into uh, the, the uh, an actual method based on data of estimating right uh, relationships so that we uh, we need this basic uh, uh, analysis review in order to be able to apply that to uh, the method of macroeconomic modeling so so these are the questions that you would be answering so first you remember I talked about uh, right graphical uh, representation okay so uh, is this is you would have the, uh, the 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 explanatory variable would usually be on the horizontal axis uh, as usual uh, and the dependent variable on the vertical axis so we know here uh, quickly that uh, the um, the what we are trying to do here is to know whether the uh, predictions that we are making from the model, okay, if they track, if they track the actual variables, right? Do they track the actual variables? Let me let me let me show you uh, the the this uh, this. Uh, results first, and then we'll come back. How now you once you we, we have understood this, and we'll go back to the graphics, and then you will understand that better. So suppose that I apply the OLS, I apply the OLS uh, to the model that you saw before. Y is equal to beta naught plus beta one uh, x one. Uh, plus the error term. So remember the error term is that we don't want to remember that, to, to forget that. So you will get these results from any package. You can use uh, what's known as EViews um, regression package. You can use what's known as R regression package. Uh, any of the uh, regression uh, packages that you, you want to use, you can use in order to, uh, to estimate your regression, okay? Uh, here I use what's known as Gretel, okay, which can be found online. 
in order to get this uh, these results. So that's, that's G R E T L Reto uh, that you can find online. You can download it if you want. R Big R is also another estimation package which you can also download online, which you can also use in terms of these estimations. So these are the results, okay? And you remember your, your model is, is Y is equal to beta naught, the constant plus beta one uh, times X one uh, plus the epsilon. The epsilon, the residuals, you will not see numbers on that. Uh, so you will, we were going to look at the, uh, you know, the, uh, the, there's no coefficient for the residuals. Uh, so we are going to look at the graphics. Uh, we are going to estimate uh, the residuals from the numbers of how much the proportion that we were able to explain the proportion of the dependent variable that we are able to explain on the basis of the explanatory variable, okay? That would give us an indication of the, uh, the residuals. And that we also wanna look at the graphical analysis of the residuals. So, that's why I skipped over that. So you can you can look at the numbers and we'll go back to those graphics. So what do we have here? Uh, you have the column of coefficients. So we have an estimation of beta one uh, and beta zero, okay? My constant, remember, is beta zero. So in this situation, beta zero is negative. Is negative 82.38. Remember, uh, so if you think of it, this as a line, so the line, the line will start uh, below zero. And then of course it will be a positive line because the coefficient beta one is positive. Okay, that's positive 0 0.012. So the relationship between uh, the uh, government uh, expenditure and jobs, uh, youth jobs, okay? That relationship, the measure of that relationship is beta one and it is equal to 0 0.012. So if I wanted to write this model uh, with numbers, now that I have estimated the numbers, if I wanted to write the model with numbers, then it will be that uh, y is equal to negative 82.38 plus 0 0.012 times, right, government expenditure. Jobs y equal to negative 82.38 plus 0 0.012 times government expenditure, right? So that is my estimated results, okay? And what you then have, uh, um, what, are your, uh, what are your errors in each one of these estimations, okay? The package will give it to you also. You, you don't calculate these things. Uh, the uh, econometric package will give you these results. Once you've fed the data, if you, you have to learn how to feed the data and, and then get these results. So uh, the, the standard error, right, uh, is measuring obviously the, basically uh, the, 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 the proportion that we are not able to explain, right, in each one of these, uh, these variables. Uh, so that uh, you have, for example, for constant uh, 18.34. Again, this comes from the package. And of course, uh, you, you also have 0 0.001 for, uh, the, in terms of standard error, okay? The gap, okay? Uh, the typical standard uh, gap 
is what we are measuring here. Uh, in terms of the estimated and the actual, is what we are, uh, or in terms of what the model is estimating and what uh, we can estimate as the actual, okay? And so you have the T ratio, which is uh, the coefficient divided by the standard error. The T ratio for the constant is negative 0.4, negative 4.490. Okay, it's negative because the coefficient is negative and you are dividing the coefficient by the standard error. Okay, that gives you the T ratio. Okay, uh, for government expenditure, uh, uh, there is a bit of displacement here. So uh, in, the, in the way that uh, the, uh, the slide is looking, so sorry about that, but the government expenditure T ratio is 11.24. Okay, so that is again the uh, if you divide the coefficient for government expenditure 0 0.012 by the standard error, that should give you 11.24. Okay, and then you have the p value. The p value uh, gives you the probability. Okay, that uh, essentially this coefficient are zero, that there is no relationship. What is the probability that there is no relationship? The hypothesis, suppose we, we, we pause a hypothesis that uh, in fact, there is no relationship, that these coefficients are zero, okay? Uh, the p-value gives you that probability and it's, so, it's very small, that probability is so small here, uh, you know, 0 0.0012, uh, in, in fact, uh, for the government expenditure, it's less, less than 0 0.0001, which means that the probability that uh, these coefficients would be zero is so very small. Okay, so the smaller the p-value, the stronger your uh, estimated results. Okay, the higher the p-value, the weaker your estimated result. okay? That's essentially how you want to read the p-value, okay? And um, in this case, we, when we get to the hypothesis testing, we will know more, uh, we will learn more about, uh, you know, the strength, what I mean by strength and what I mean by weakness, because it, it has to do, with the significance levels. And so it has to do what's known as hypothesis testing. But we'll get to that, okay? We will also get to the rest of these measurements and explain them, right? The, what do we mean by uh, the mean dependent variable is essentially, right? The mean uh, is estimated in your data, right? Uh, what is the mean value? Uh, we will explain what we will see soon, what is the sum squared residual uh, and the, uh, the standard uh, deviation of the dependent variables, the R square, et cetera. We will see those things in just a moment. But let's go back to the graphical representation. So now that you have seen the estimated model, the question is uh, what is the relationship between the uh, the actual the actual data on youth jobs and the predicted youth jobs? What is the relationship? Uh, is that relationship uh, zero, which means that your prediction uh, is essentially useless in that sense? Is it a positive relationship? How tight is that relationship? Is it a negative relationship? Um, um, in, uh, obviously, in our case, it's going to have to be that we are either we are we have a tight uh, uh, relationship or we don't, or that the relationship is basically zero. In this particular case, you can see that there's a, a clear trend. 
right? Between uh, the predicted uh, and the actual jobs, the youth jobs. Very clear that it's a positive. When you look at the points, okay, uh, they clearly point right towards a positive. You can draw a line through those points and essentially that's the red line. And you can see the gaps, right? Between each point and that line. And essentially visually, you can essentially uh, come out with the conclusion that this estimation is not so bad. It looks to be tracking pretty well, right? Uh, the actual jobs Y, the predicted jobs Y seem to be tracking pretty well uh, the actual jobs Y. So the relationship clearly has a trend uh, and clearly uh, along the trend line uh, that the variations are along the trend line uh, uh, do not show uh, any, uh, any outliers uh, or big gaps that, uh, that can be uh, throwing right, the modeling off the rail. We also look at uh, the residual, okay? Uh, graphically, okay? And so again, you look at whether there is a pattern, is there a trend uh, in the residuals? Because if you have patterns, then it means that your regression may not be capturing uh, very well all the variations in the uh, dependent variable. And so again, you have, uh, in this case, the regression around uh, the points around zero uh, do not show any particular pattern that you can sort of talk about here, okay? Um, but we, we will measure that to see if whether or not that visualization uh, is borne out in terms of the numbers, okay? You have seen these uh, estimation results, and now we are going to talk about how do you uh, check your regression? How do you know that this is a good regression? It's known as the analysis of variance, right? ANOVA, okay? Uh, sorry, here. Yeah. So analysis of variance, ANOVA, okay? Uh, let's, let's focus on the right-hand side for, for now. And then, and then we will now come back to the left-hand side, right, the, to the table, okay? So let's just sort of uh, explain some of the notions, okay? So um, the amount of variation in the dependent variable that you can attribute, that you can attribute to the explanatory variable is known as the sum of squares regression. Again, in our example, the amount of changes in youth jobs that can be attributed to uh, government expenditure is known as the sum of squared, squares regression. Okay, so for example, let's denote uh, Y prime, let's use Y prime to denote the estimated values of the dependent variable, okay? And uh, Y bar, okay? Uh, to mean the, essentially the average, the mean dependent variable, okay? Then the sum of squares regression is really a sum. So you can see the, 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 the sum operated there, the summation operated there, right? So it's the sum of the difference between uh, the estimated values of, of the dependent variable and their mean. Okay, the mean, the actual mean of the dependent variable. That difference between 
the estimated value. And here it means that each month, so month uh, one, what is the estimated value of the dependent variable? Month two, what is the estimated variable, uh, value of the dependent variable based on our model? Month three, all the way to month 12. And, and then you will then take the difference between each of those values and the mean, right? You sum that up and you square them. And that is uh, your sum of squares regression. It is telling you how much, how much of the changes in the dependent variable can be attributed to the explanatory variable, okay? How much of the jobs, youth jobs variation can be explained to be more clear, right? To be, can be explained, attributed to uh, the uh, government expenditure. That is being captured by the sum of squares regression. So that's one of the numbers that you get, all right? Uh, if you look at here, uh, it's one of the numbers uh, that you get from the, uh, when you, you get the estimated uh, results. Now, the sum of square residual, sum of squares residual, this is known as the error sum of squares. Okay, uh, this is the variation now. So the other side of it in the dependent variable not explained by the explanatory variable. All right, so the changes in the dependent variable, in our case, the dependent variable is uh, youth jobs, okay? That is not explained by government expenditure, okay? So how do we find that? The sum of the squared deviation between the observed values, okay, the actual values of the dependent variable and the corresponding estimated values. So uh, the uh, error sum of square is calculated as the sum of y minus y Prime. Remember y prime was the estimated values and y, uh, that is the actual value. You take the difference, right? That gives you, you square, of course, the, the difference. That gives you uh, the error sum of square. Remember again, the y prime has to be, right? For each, in our case, we have 12 months. So for each month, and the y is also the observed value for each month, okay? And so, the, the difference squared gives you the error uh, sum of square. So your total, your total sum of squares in this analysis, okay, is the sum of square regression plus the error sum of square. Okay, that's also known as the total. Uh, sum of squares. So you go here, uh, you can find your sum of square uh, regression, okay? Uh, you can also, from, from uh, our calculations, once you have that, uh, you can use the data on the estimated values here, okay? Uh, in order to find the sum of square regression, just the way that we explain it here. And also, when, when you, once you put those two together, then it becomes your sum of square total. Okay. So, in our example, okay, uh, the sum of square regression. Okay. Now let's go back to, let's go to the left hand side. Okay and look at what's known as the ANOVA table, again, given to you by the, uh, the package. So let's, on the left-hand side now, the ANOVA table. Yeah, and look at the table gives you the sum of squares. 
uh, that's the first column. So it, it provides you with the sum of squares for regression, for residual, and the total. And we will see in just a moment why those are important. The um, degree of freedom is called uh, DF. Okay. Uh, we have 12 uh, months of data. Okay. So the degree of freedom is usually n minus one. n is the total right, uh, number of observations for the data. So our number, of, the total number of observations for this example is 12. The degree of freedom total is usually n minus one. And that's how we calculate it. So it'll be 11 here. Of course, you have your your mean squares uh, on the third uh, in the third column. So now let's check how good is our regression. The first uh, indicator that we usually use when we look at a regression is known as the R square. Again, if you go back here, your R square, okay, is uh, it was zero point nine two six seven etc cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, so that would be the first indicator, okay? What is that saying? It's saying when I take my sum of square regression, again, remember that is the, the changes in Y attributed to uh, the, the X variable. Um, so when I take those changes, okay, the square, and I take it as proportion of the total sum of square, okay? As a proportion, how much can I explain as a proportion of the total sum of square? That number is the R square. That number has to vary between zero and one. So you can either explain nothing, okay? Or you can explain everything <laughs> that's the the spectrum most of the time uh the r square would neither be zero completely and it will not be one completely if you are if you if it is one then you should question that there's a problem with your regression uh because you can't as i say from the beginning uh it is not possible because we are, we, are, we are talking about uh, processes that are on, ongoing that we can't, it's not a lab, it's not in a lab. Uh, so there, there will always be some errors. Uh, it could even be in, uh, the way the data is presented or uh, the way that the processes are happening uh, in the real world. So there's always going to be a proportion that will not be explained or captured in your model. So it is not clear, it's not for sure that the R square can ever be one. If it is, uh, you have to sort of uh, uh, go back and, and, uh, and look at your model. Um, the R square can be close to zero because there might not be any relationship at all between the dependent variable and the explanatory variable. It's, that's possible. But usually what we want is the higher the R square, the better, right? Your uh, regression, the higher the R square. As the R square moves towards one, the better your regression, because it means that uh, the explanatory variable is explaining more and more of the uh, dependent variable, right? Uh, so that's that's what. So the higher when when you look at the various uh, 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 combination of uh, uh, of of, of uh, uh, variables, particularly when we start talking about multiple regression analysis, and then we are looking at uh, the the R square for each. Uh, iteration of a model. And then if you see the R square increasing, okay, generally speaking, uh, the, 
the, the, that's the first indicator of, of whether or not your model uh, is gaining power in terms of explanatory uh, power, okay? Now, so that's one indicator. The, another indicator is uh, what's known as the F statistic, okay? Again, if you go back here, okay, you would have the F statistics there, uh, which is 126.44, okay? So the, what is the F statistics? The F statistics uh, measures the, again, overall quality, okay, uh, of your uh, regression results. So it takes the sum of square regression as we explain it uh, on the right-hand side. You take it, uh, divided by the mean square residual, the mean square residual. So in our case, in the ANOVA table, the sum of square regression is 38,118.3. As we got from the, um, we got from the package, the regression analysis package. The mean, the mean, uh, uh, square residual uh, is 3.1.46. Uh, when I take the proportion, it gives me the F statistics, which is 126.44, okay? Now, how do I know whether or not that's good or bad? <laughs> okay, whether or not that's good or bad is, uh, is the p-value of the F statistics. Uh, that's what, uh, uh, I have that in red here. The p-value of the F statistics is so small so that uh, you look at it, you say there is no, uh, almost the probability of this uh, F statistics uh, not showing a strong relationship. And once again, we are measuring the, the, rela the, the relationship right, uh, through the sum of square regression, okay, through the sum of square regression. And we are saying, if I take the sum of square regression, I divide by the mean square residual. Again, right, so I'm, it's another way of saying, what am I explaining, what am I not explaining? And if I say, okay, the amount that I'm explaining, and if I say that, I take that and I, I use it uh, as and take the proportion in terms of what the amount that I'm not explaining, okay? Again, the mean square residual is essentially uh, another way of looking at what I'm not explaining in the model, okay? The probability, the p-value is telling me here that the probability that in this result, the probability that there is no strong relationship between the y and x variables, uh, that probability is extremely small, okay? That's what the p-value is telling me here. It's very extremely small, it's almost zero, it's essentially zero. And so uh, this, when I look at the R square and I look at the F statistics, uh, and uh, the R square being 0.92, is close to, but not equal to one, but close to one. Um, the F statistics, the p-value uh, is essentially zero. So it means the probability that this relation, this regression is, uh, the probability that this regression is the explanatory value, the explanatory power of this regression, the probability that is not strong is almost zero. So this is, indicating uh, a pretty uh, good relationship regression uh, regression uh, results, right? That's what this, the ANOVA table here is telling me, okay? Now, um, the, having seen the, uh, the, how you would conceptually 
conceptually, right, develop a model. This, of course, is a very simple model, linear model. Having seen how, uh, what type of data, for example, you can use, we've seen the methodology you can use to estimate the relationship. And we have seen the uh, indicators, at least in this case, we, we looked at at least uh, a, a few indicators um, of the strength of our model estimation. Uh, we now should look at what are the assumptions behind right, this methodology, this regression analysis. What are we assuming? There are many assumptions that have to be made in order for this methodology to uh, be useful, okay? In order for us to interpret, in order for us to make inference from the estimated results to uh, policy or to uh, explaining any uh, even non-policy relationships, right? So uh, the first assumption in the example that we are using is linear, linearity, linearity, right? What does that mean? Uh, we assume that there is a linear relationship between the explanatory variable X and the independent variable y, right? Uh, so you saw the graph, um, you saw the, the numbers, that is our assumption. When I write down this model, if I validate, if, the, if this assumption is violated, then it could mean that there is no relationship between x and y, or that the relationship has curvature. That is why it, I said it before, it is important to plot your data uh, right, right away. Okay, it's important to, to plot your data right away. And so, uh, and then so you can look and see whether the data is, uh, if it's a linear relationship or uh, if it's a square relationship, if it is uh, some type of, uh, you know, uh, maybe it's a sine, a cosine type of relationship, et cetera. So if non-linearity is, is suspected, then we will have to apply a, a non-linear transformation to the variables. It could be to the dependent, or the independent variable. So we can take the low log, we can take the square root, the reciprocal, et cetera. These are examples of how you would uh, apply transformation to the variables in order to be able to estimate the relationship in case you are suspecting nonlinear uh, uh, relationship. So these are some examples, right? So. On the left-hand side, you have the y on the vertical axis, the, the uh, x variable on the, uh, the, the horizontal axis. So in the, the left side uh, figure shows a linear relationship between the two variables. So this is of course positive, okay? The right-hand side, Right, shows a non-linear relationship. Uh, so you can see uh, uh, some type of curvature there, okay? Uh, and, and so you cannot directly apply the methodology based on a linear assumption to a non-linear uh, relationship without transformation. That's what we are saying, okay? so. That's why it's important to, to visualize the data. I keep on saying that, but it's, it's so important to visualize the data and that would inform, right? The type of uh, uh, method, type of even the type of modeling uh, that you need to uh, apply. 
okay? So um, this is an example, for example, of no relationship between uh, uh, X and Y. You look at here, the, the left-hand side, as I said, is linear, the right-hand side that has a curvature. Uh, here, there is no relationship, okay? So you, have, you can see the, the points, the observations are going all over the place, okay, without a particular pattern. And so it's very difficult in this case to apply a regression analysis in this type of data, okay? The second assumption that we uh, make is known as homoscedasticity, okay? Uh, what is homoscedasticity? Um, this is an assumption of constant variance of the residuals uh, across all values of the independent variable, okay? Uh, so we can always, once you have an estimate, uh, estimated result, your estimated results, you have your fitted variable values, you have the residuals, you can check your homoscedasticity assumption by looking at the plot of the fitted versus, versus the residuals, I uh, will see that. So if this assumption is not met, if, if it is not met, then we say that the residuals are heteroscedastic. And so, uh, but so if you have heteroscedasticity in place, it means the regression results are not reliable. So that's why it's important to check assumptions if they are holding, okay? And so, Unreliable regression results can lead to uh, wrong decisions. For example, uh, you may have an estimated variable that uh, is seem to be showing in the uh, in the results that uh, it has a significant relationship. Right between the X and, and the Y variables, statistically speaking. But in fact, such a relationship may not exist. And so if you base decisions on, on uh, such a model, and the error there would have been that the analysts would not have checked for homoscedasticity and make the transformations that may have been necessary. For example, again, uh, if, if you suspect homoscedasticity, uh, oh, I'm sorry, if you suspect heteroscedasticity, then you might uh, uh, take, for example, log, uh, transforming the, the dependent variable, uh, or uh, use what's known as a weighted regression, uh, et cetera. You might, for example, we use uh, GDP a lot. So sometimes instead of using the, um, nominal value of GDP or even the real value of GDP, we might use growth uh, uh, versus the stock of, of, uh, of the variable. So, uh, so any of these, these, uh, these transformations uh, will, 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 might take care of heteroscedasticity, but if you don't do it, uh, then your estimations may not be reliable. So for example, here's, here's an example. These are residuals versus the fitted very, very, uh, values, okay? Fitted means the estimated value, uh, values, okay, of your, uh, of your dependent variable. That's what we mean by fitted, okay? Now, so we are checking here for homoscedasticity, okay? Now, so you clearly see that there is a pattern here. Okay, uh, when you look at the residuals versus the fitted value, there's a pattern, kind of cone shaped. And so that would indicate to me that there is, uh, there might be the presence of heteroscedasticity, uh, which is again why visualizing is so much important. Okay, after this is after you have uh, estimated the model. You have obtained your uh, estimated values, your fitted values, uh, and then you look at uh, how the residuals compared to 
uh, uh, relate to those fictive values. So clearly here, uh, it's, it's not possible not to assume right, heteroscedasticity. Another way of looking at it, uh, if you look at uh, what do we mean by constant variance, um, constant variance, the left-hand side panel shows there is uh, no particular shape in the residuals, in the residuals versus the fitted values, right? No particular shape, this constant spread, uh, you know, so there is no, no, uh, no pattern, no particular pattern, okay, in the way this left-hand side panel figure here, uh, no particular pattern in the way that uh, the, um, the residuals are spreading, right, across the fitted values. On the other side, on the right-hand side uh, panel figure here, uh, clearly you can see a pattern, right? So you can see that uh, from uh, the start, right, between uh, zero and the 10, uh, there is a tight variations, variation between uh, um, the residual and the fitted value. The spread, the gap of the spread is, uh, is not so wide, it's pretty tight. And then you get to about 10 here, and then it becomes wild, right? So it's all over the place. So, uh, uh, you know, almost looks like a hammerhead arrow. And so uh, clearly there is a pattern so that there's no constant variance. So, so the, uh, in the right-hand side figure, uh, you would say that uh, there is likely to be a presence of hetero elasticity and uh, the left hand side uh, you would likely uh, conclude that there is that this is a homo uh, uh, you know uh, estimated result data spread the third assumption uh, that we make is normality okay a normality assumption uh, means essentially that the, um, the shape of the residuals, okay, would look like this figure, okay? Starting from a point a zero, let's say, um, and then, um, increasing, okay, smoothly, increasing, reaching an inflection point, then reaching a turning point, a maximum, then coming down again all the way to zero. So that shape, okay, is what we call in statistics, uh, you know, a normal distribution of the residuals. So there are many other distribution that, but well, this is what we assume uh, in order to be able to apply this methodology, okay? So if this is violated, as you can check, um, then maybe there are some big outliers that are influencing the data. Uh, if you take, if you take data over several African countries and Nigeria is included, uh, Ethiopia is included, Egypt is included in a, that data set and you don't find a way to control for population because let's say the data set has Nigeria, uh, Ethiopia, Egypt, and at the same time would have other countries like Guinea, Bissau, Benin, Togo, Gabon, uh, Comoros and, 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 uh, and South of and Principal, Principal and so on. Uh, so, and then you are applying the same model to 
to that kind of data set you don't control for population, uh, you may be possibly violating this uh, assumption. In other words, there might be outliers that may uh, have a big influence on the data. Okay, and so we, in that kind of situation, again, uh, transforming the, the, the data, right, the, the various variables, uh, take the log. If you take the log, for example, uh, in the data I just described, uh, that would resolve the issue. Um, uh, take the growth, take uh, square root, et cetera, et cetera, to try and account for uh, uh, the possibility of uh, big outliers, uh, you know, uh, in the data set. Now, uh, so we have, we, we know how to check for our uh, uh, assumptions. We have our estimated results. Now we uh, can proceed with what's known as hypothesis testing. Okay, hypothesis testing. In this case, the question is, uh, we need to, we want to test the hypothesis that government expenditures have no impact. This is the hypothesis. Government expenditure have no impact on youth employment. So GS has zero impact on jobs Y, okay? We want to test that hypothesis. How would we set up the problem and how do we test it? Okay, the first, the first thing is, uh, you know, question of notations. So you have uh, usually uh, in hypothesis testing, uh, you have what's known as the null hypothesis and the alternative hypothesis null hypothesis, alternative hypothesis. The null hypothesis is essentially what you want to test, usually, right? So in our, in, in our uh, example here, the null hypothesis uh, will be that GX has no impact on jobs Y. We would usually use uh, H naught, to indicate the null hypothesis. And we will usually use H1, H1 to indicate the alternative hypothesis. And so the alternative hypothesis here would be that GX has indeed a significant impact on jobs Y. Okay, so we can set up the problem in, in this way. So H naught, that beta one is equal to zero. That's my null hypothesis, H naught beta one is equal to zero. Uh, H one, my alternative hypothesis uh, would say beta one is not equal to zero. In some cases, we can be more specific to even say uh, that null hypothesis that H, that beta one is greater than zero, or that beta one is less than zero. That's known as uh, a one tail uh, uh, hypothesis test testing. We will see what that means, the tail. Uh, but here we will sort of capture both and just kind of stay more generally in terms of our hypothesis and say that beta one not equal to zero. So, how do we test such a hypothesis? Uh, this will require using the t-statistics. I showed you before the t-statistics uh, in the in the. Um, uh, if you recall, uh, if I may go back here to the results here. So I showed you the t-ratio, the t-statistics. For the constant beta naught is negative. Uh, 4.49 for GS, uh, X1, the T ratio is 11.24. So now we are going to use that, those values 
in the hypothesis testing. Okay. And so, and since we are focusing on beta one, okay, uh, we will use the T statistics associated with beta one. I think it was 11.4. And so, how do we do the test? Well, we, we need to determine in statistics what's known as the desired significance level. So we can, the, the typically, typically uh, we use 1%, uh, 5% significant levels to test against because those significance levels are associated with a, a, a critical value, okay, uh, that we need to test against or threshold value that we need to test against in terms the, of the, the statistics, the T statistics of the coefficient that we are interested in. So, if you are using a, if you want to, if you want to use the strength, the significance, right, of your relationship, you want to demonstrate it using, statistically speaking, following the normal, normality assumption, normal distribution then a 5% significance level is associated with a critical value, a threshold value of 1.96. That's just there, it's just statistics. So if you, these are, the, this is a standard normal distribution, okay? okay. Uh, and so in this case, uh, this is the, uh, uh, for a significance level of five, five percent. Okay, on both sides, on both tails here. Okay, and so we would say that values that fall into the regions. Okay, that are greater than the critical value, okay, uh, that those values show that we can reject the null hypothesis, okay? And all values that fall into a region, this is an absolute term, into the region, this is the blue region here, all values that fall into region that are uh, uh, that where the values are less than the critical value, okay, we would say that we cannot reject the null hypothesis. So in our case here, the red tails, right, the red colors on both tails show where you would want your value to fall if you want to your t statistics to fall in absolute terms if you want to reject the null hypothesis. Okay, so uh, here we are considering a two tail approach. Uh, uh, if I go back here, we are considering a two tail uh, a measurement, significance level. So that's why I keep on saying absolute terms. So if your the absolute value of your t-statistics is greater or equal, if you want to, but equal, you're on the borderline. But so, uh, so if it's greater or equal to 1.96, then we reject the null hypothesis. Okay. Now, if your t-statistics is Less is less than 1.96 in our case. The, by the way, the 1.96 does not change. That's the critical value associated with the 5% significance level. 
okay? So it doesn't change in statistics and normal distribution. All right, so those critical values, uh, you can even find at the table, okay? And so all you need to do, because those critical values don't change for uh, significance levels, all you need to do is essentially compare the T statistics that come from your estimation, your estimated model to those critical values. So all, what you need to do to test the hypothesis is one, of course, you need to uh, pause, you need to uh, actually uh, understand the hypothesis that you're testing. That's the first thing. Second thing is uh, you need to choose your significance level. Is it 5%, is it 1%? Some people may go to 10%, but usually in published uh, papers, uh, we usually do not see 10% so much being accepted. 1%, 5%, yes. Once you have chosen your significance level, then you just go to a table uh, or a, a, a standard normal distribution table uh, figure like this to determine your critical value. And once you have your critical value, then you can do the comparison between your T statistics and the critical value, okay? Again, here for a 1% significance level, the critical value, which does not change, as I said, is 2.58. So for all, if our T statistic for beta one uh, is greater or equal to 2.58, we would say that we reject the null hypothesis at 1% level. So, so it is important for the, for the analyst to have chosen, you the one as the analyst, you are the one that selects the significance level that you want to test your estimated values against, all right? So why is hypothesis that's important? Why well, it's simply important because if you cannot determine with uh, some degree of certainty, the um, strength of the relationship between the, the two variables that you are positing, uh, a, 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 you are modeling a relationship about, uh, then you can't, it becomes useless in terms of uh, inferences, right? In terms of forecasting, okay? So, Hypothesis testing is so very important for that. You have to be able to understand the strength, to measure, not just understand, to measure the strength of your, uh, your results, okay? For each coefficient and for the model as a whole. We saw that for the model as a whole, we saw the R square, we saw the F statistics. Uh, which the hypothesis testing can also apply to that. Here we are now testing, right, uh, for one of the coefficients. You can apply the same, if you have a multiple re a regression, you can apply the same for all the coefficients, okay? And so in our particular case, we are saying, let's test the hypothesis that government expenditure has no impact on jobs Y, okay? The alternative hypothesis would be that, yes, there is an impact, okay? All right, so that's H1, H, H0 is beta, one is equal to zero. H1, beta one is not, equal to, excuse me, is not equal to zero. Once we, we now determine, uh, our significance levels, 5%. If I say 5% significance level, my critical value is 1.96, okay? 
my T statistics is 11.24 from my results. Clearly, it is greater than 1.96, clearly. So uh, I reject the null hypothesis that government expenditure has no significant impact. At the 5% level, I reject that null hypothesis, okay? That government, uh, I reject it. In other words, uh, at the 5% level, uh, we can say that beta not is not equal to zero. I mean, beta one is not equal to zero. And not only that, that uh, it is significantly impacting, that government expenditure is significantly impacting jobs Y, right? That's what I'm, that's what this means, that there is a significant uh, impact and that significance level is 5%. When I use 1.96, now, I might even want to be uh, even stronger than that and say, I will only allow 1% error. That's what this means, by the way, right? If you look at, uh, if you look at the, the tails, right? Okay. And so I, will, I can use the 1% significance level. And in that case, the critical value is 2.58. So my T statistics has to be greater than in absolute value, absolute term, has to be greater than or equal to 2.58 in order for me to reject the null hypothesis. Well, in this case, uh, the T uh, statistics is 11.24. So, 11.24 is greater than both 1.96 and 2.58. So we can, in this situation, say that the null hypothesis has been rejected both at the 5% level, significance level, and 1% significance level. So the overall conclusion of this analysis is that government expenditure in our example indeed has a significant and positive impact on youth jobs creation. That's what we can say. And so once we know that, then uh, and we have the we have these results, we have checked for all our uh, assumptions, uh, then you can present this result to a policymaker. And, uh, and, uh, and, make, and so decisions can, can be made because you have checked, right? You have checked all uh, your, uh, your different levels of indications of the, uh, of your, you know, the significance of your model and the strength of your model, the, uh, the overall um, uh, uh, significance and the significance um, Per coefficient, okay. So that is that. Those are the steps you have to go through in order before you present regression results in terms of publication or in terms of uh, decision making uh, for it to make sense. Okay. So we we have seen the uh, the graph for normal uh, for normal distribution. 